Hello everybody, this is Margareta Harris in WHO Headquarters Geneva, welcoming you to our Global Press Briefing on Current Health Issues today, 27th of September 2023. As usual, we'll start with opening remarks from our Director General, Dr Tedros Adnom Ghebreyesus, and he will be joined by some special guests today. I will then open the floor to questions and our panel of technical experts, both here in the room and online, will, will be available to answer your questions. So in the room, we have Dr Tedros in the centre. And to Dr Tedros right, we have Dr Michael Ryan, Executive Director of our Health Emergencies Program. And next to Dr Michael Ryan is Dr Sylvie Brion, our Director of Epidemic and Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention. To Dr. Tedros left, we have Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, our technical lead for COVID-19. And next to Dr. Van Kerkhoff, we have Professor Grosbeck Parham, uh, the co-chair of the Director General's Expert Group for the Elimination of Cervical Cancer. And we also have a large panel of experts online, as I mentioned, and we will call upon them whenever appropriate. So now, without further ado, we will go to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, good, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First, at the Northern Hemisphere winter approach, we continue to see concerning trends for COVID-19. Among the relatively few countries that report them, both hospitalizations and ICU admissions have increased in the past 28 days, particularly in the Americas and Europe. Meanwhile, vaccination levels among the most at-risk groups remain worryingly low. Two-thirds of the world's population has received a complete primary series, but only one-third has received an additional or booster dose. COVID-19 may no longer be the acute crisis it was two years ago, but that does not mean we can ignore it. Countries invested so much in building their systems to respond to COVID-19. We urge countries to sustain those systems to ensure people can be protected, tested and treated for COVID-19 and other infectious threats. That means sustaining systems for collaborative surveillance, community protection, safe and scalable care, access to countermeasures and coordination. Now to cholera. Last week, WHO published new data showing that cases reported in 2022 were more than double those in 2021. Preliminary data for this year suggest 2023 is likely to be even worse. So far, 28 countries have reported cases this year, compared with 16 during the same period last year. The countries with the most concerning outbreaks right now are Ethiopia, Haiti, Iraq, and Sudan. Significant progress has been made in countries in Southern Africa, including Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, but these countries remain at risk as the rainy season approaches. The worst affected countries and communities are poor, without access to safe drinking water or toilets. They also face shortages of oral cholera vaccine and other supplies, as well as overstretched health workers who are dealing with multiple disease outbreaks and other health emergencies. WHO is providing essential supplies, coordinating the on-ground, the on-ground, on-the-ground response with partners, supporting countries to detect, prevent and treat cholera, and informing people how to protect themselves. To support this work, we have appealed for 160 million US dollars and we have released over 16 million dollars from the WHO Contingency Fund for Emergencies. 
But the real solution to cholera lies in ensuring everyone has access to safe water and sanitation, which is an internationally recognized human right. Now to Libya, which is no longer in the headlines, but remains in a state of crisis following the devastating floods a few weeks ago. Officially, more than 4,000 people are dead. More than 8,500 8, are missing, and more than 30,000 have been displaced. Only a third of hospitals and half of primary health centers remain fully functional due to structural damage to health facilities and hospitals, lack of medicine and medical equipment, and shortages of health workers. Affected communities are facing the threat of mosquito and waterborne diseases and acute mental distress. <coughs> WHO is working closely with Libya's Ministry of Health to assess the needs on the ground, provide supplies, and restore primary health care services, especially for routine immunization and mental health. To support this work, we have appealed for $11 million US dollars and released $2.3 million from the Contingency Fund for Emergencies. Now to the United Nations General Assembly in New York last week, where world leaders gathered for a record three high-level meetings dedicated to health issues. At each, they approved political declarations containing strong commitments. At the first meeting on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, they committed to conclude negotiations on the pandemic accord and amendments to the international health regulations by May next year. To ensure equitable access to vaccines and other medical countermeasures, to address mis- and disinformation, to strengthen the global health workforce, to invest in strengthening WHO, and more. The second high-level meeting was on universal health coverage, which all countries have committed to achieving by 2030 in the Sustainable Development Goals. In the lead up to the meeting, WHO and the World Bank published new data showing that half the world's population are not fully covered by essential health services and that 2 billion people face financial hardship due to out-of-pocket health spending including 1.3 billion who are impoverished by it. In the political declaration, countries made more than 50 commitments to progressively expand access to essential health services, to reverse the trend of catastrophic out-of-pocket health spending, to strengthen primary health care, to expand access to essential medicines, to promote active and healthy lifestyles, to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health services, and much more. The third high-level meeting was on tuberculosis. TB kills more than one million people every year. In the political declaration, countries committed to reach 90% of people with TB for prevention and care, to use the WHO recommended rapid test at the first method of diagnosis, to provide social benefit packages to all people with TB so they don't endure financial hardship, to close funding gaps for TB implementation and research, and to license at least one new TB vaccine. Developing a new vaccine is especially important. In that regard, WHO has established TB Vaccine Accelerator Council, led by health ministers which held its first meeting during the General Assembly. We thank Member States for the three political declarations, and now is the time to act. We look forward to supporting all countries to turn these commitments into realities. Finally, to cervical cancer. WHO's commitment to universal health coverage means we're working to address all causes of death for all people in all countries. But we're particularly focused on the most significant cause of death and disease for the most vulnerable groups, 
every two minutes, a woman dies of cervical cancer. 90% of them in low and middle income countries. Cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer related death among women in Africa. But it's the one cancer we can eliminate thanks to vaccines against human papilloma virus, which is responsible for the vast majority of cases. Almost three years ago, WHO launched a global initiative to eliminate cervical cancer by expanding access to vaccination, screening and treatment for women in all countries. Last year, WHO recommended that one dose of vaccine offers comparable protection to two doses of, for girls and women under 21 years of age, meaning the global supply of vaccines can be used to protect many more women and girls. This week, the expert group on cervical cancer elimination met to review progress and advise on the future direction for the initiative. To say more, I'm pleased to welcome co-chair Professor Grosbeck Parham, who is joining us here in Geneva, uh, to, and Professor Parham, thank you for your leadership on this vital issue, and you have the floor. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Tedros. It is truly <clears throat> an honor to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to talk just a bit about the recent deliberations of, the, of your expert group. <clears throat> As you have said, following the launch of the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative, the uh, Director General's expert group was established. <clears throat> The purpose of the group is to advise you on possible new areas for innovation, intervention, and acceleration of the implementation of cervical cancer prevention and treatment services across the globe. But as you have said, with a particular focus on areas in the world <clears throat> where the burden is highest, that's where the poorest and most marginalized women reside. <clears throat> The scope of the advice that can be given to you can be strategic or technical in nature, as well as approaches to advocacy and resource mobilization. <clears throat> For this year's meeting, which was our fourth, we assembled a group of well-informed individuals from both inside and outside of WHO <clears throat> to provide technical updates on the three pillars of your global strategy, which are HPV vaccination of young girls, cervical cancer screening of adult women, and treatment of women who are discovered to have precancer or invasive cancer during the screening process. These are the three pillars. Following the presentations, the experts were allowed to deliberate in closed session amongst themselves for over two days. While the final recommendations that will be sent your way are still being formulated, the initial reflections of the expert group consist of the following. Number one, there should now be a heavy emphasis on country-specific support for the implementation of the three pillars. We know how to vaccinate young girls. We know how to screen adult women. We know how to surgically treat women who are found to have early stage invasive cancer. We know how to provide radiation treatment to cure the vast number of women who are found to have advanced disease. We don't, they felt that we need fewer guidelines fewer guidance from WHO, but more resources that focus on supporting field workers in the countries that have the highest burden of the disease. <clears throat> Number two, all three pillars should be implemented collectively, not just HPV vaccination for young girls, but also screening of adult women. And a certain percentage of those women who are screened are going to be found to have invasive cancer. So they should have the infrastructure, should be present 
to treat those women. Number three, there was acknowledgement, as you mentioned, of the current evidence supporting the one-dose HPV vaccination and other potential game-changing innovations such as artificial intelligence-based cervical cancer screening. Those studies are in pro process, in progress right now. <clears throat> and number four, information hubs need to be created that facilitate countries sharing their successes. There are too many countries the group felt were operating in silos. For instance, Rwanda has had great success in vaccinating greater than 90% of their young girls. Zambia, Malawi, Lesotho have discovered how to screen large numbers of, of women in some of the poorest settings in the world. The radiation therapy centers in Tanzania and Uganda have been in existence for, for decades and have been successful in providing radiation therapy for women who have advanced disease. And there are new models for surgical training that allows surgeons to be trained in their home environment to prevent them from leaving and maybe never coming back home. <clears throat> so these are just some of the uh, initial reflections of the, of the, uh, of your group, and we will be forwarding the final recommendations to you uh, over the next few months. Again, thank you for allowing me to be here to share this information. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Parham, for your leadership on this vital issue. And I look forward to working with you in the months and years ahead as we work towards our vision of ending cervical cancer. So thank you so much, Professor, again. Thank you. Margaret, uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros and Professor Parham. So now I'll open, questions, uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, if you haven't already, please raise your hand um, on the Zoom so we can be sure. We do already have quite a lot of people in the queue, so we want to make sure we don't miss you out. And of course, state your full name, your agency, and try to stick to one question. And do please keep your questions as short as possible. Now we'll start with Belisa Gordon-Ho from W Magazine. Belisa, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Thank you for taking my question. How is the issue of the mutation of the COVID virus and other pandemics that may arise in countries that have recently suffered from natural disasters, such as Libya or Morocco or related with Nepal in India, or even in the war situations like Ukraine being managed? Thank you. Thank you, Belise. So that's a complex question. Would you like to start, Dr. Ryan? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a very broad-ranging question, but uh, uh, maybe I can begin and others may want to, um, to, come, to come in on later. I mean, there's no question in our own collective cultural memory the, the overlap of conflict, and infectious diseases and hunger have always been very close allies in, in the suffering of humankind. And there's no question uh, that currently on the planet there are zones of very high biodiversity, very, very, very fragile ecosystems that are in zones of fragility and zones of conflict in which we have people living in extreme poverty and lots of migration and movement. So we're in a very unstable situation on the planet right now in terms of the drivers of evolution of viruses and then the consequences of their emergence in human populations. So there are two factors. One is the chance that a disease may emerge. We're driving that. The consequence that that virus or a <clears throat> bacterium will have in the human population is also increased because people's basic health status is decreased. They're on the move, they're migrating, they're refugees, they're not properly nourished. Um, and then thirdly, they don't have access to care when they do get sick. So there are a whole range of factors. Uh, in the case of, uh, of flooding, just to be, to be clear, uh, there are lots of people who ask in the cases of uh, natural disasters and flooding whether dead bodies represent a, a major problem. Uh, 
it is an issue, but it is not by any way a big issue or the biggest issue. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, certainly the risk of infectious disease and flooding events goes up. It's usually due to lack of access to clean water and the fact that uh, uh, sanitation, sewage, toilet systems are overwhelmed and you end up with uh, a lot of contamination of the environment. So the risk of that <clears throat> is very high. You also see in, in groups of people who are on the move, particularly migrants, refugees, the the uh, the people pouring into Armenia right now in the cold, um, especially children, and when people are packed close, closely together in those situations, acute respiratory diseases are very common. So this is all very common sense. It's very logical. If you pack people together who are stressed, who are cold, uh, who are um, on the move, the chances are respiratory viruses will, will, will emerge in, in, in groups like that, and we have to be very careful. Measles will be another disease that emerges, diseases of overcrowding, and diseases associated with stressful, overcrowded conditions. So um, there is no question that uh, conflict and instability drive the incidence of epidemic diseases and other uh, <clears throat> uh, diseases. Uh, but it's also important to remember that those situations also reduce access to TV therapy, reduce access to mental health. I mean, in, in Libya right now, one of the biggest issues we're dealing with is a mental health crisis. People are absolutely psychologically traumatized by what's happened to them. So we can't just deal with their physical needs. We have to support their psychological needs. Equally, if you're a person arriving in Armenia today across a border, um, uh, destitute and you've lost your home, the, the impacts of that are as equally psychological as they are um, physical. So yes, <clears throat> there is this link between uh, conflict and instability and disease in humans. It's always been there. It's been amplified currently by the number of conflicts and the number of unstable situations. And if we add in climate change and climate instability, uh, Dr. Tedra spoke in his speech about, about cholera and the risk. We currently have uh, so many cholera outbreaks around the world, <clears throat> many of them very severe. They're all sensitive to climatic variability and climatic change. And that's adding another dimension to this already very, very complex uh, um, interaction. Uh, that's the downside. The upside is that we can do something about that that we can address these issues. And actually, some of the interventions to prevent these epidemics and prevent these problems are very straightforward. They're very cost effective. It does not cost that much to save a life. It does not cost that much to protect a child with vaccination. It does not cost that much to get someone on TB therapy. The fact is, we have probably, we have never before had the opportunity we've had to treat and prevent disease in a cost effective way, and especially to deliver that to those people who are in the situations that many people find themselves in today. So uh, we have to balance our concern with what's happening with the opportunity we have to do something about it. And never has that opportunity been greater. The question is whether we're going to do that. And Dr. Terra speaks about the <clears throat> high-level announcement, the high-level declarations in New York. Uh, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to go do it. And he's calling on the world to go do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. I think there's... That really says it all. <laughs> so we'll now go to Mohammed from Andalou. And Mohammed, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Margaret. Uh, as uh, as you know very well, uh, a COVID nineteen cases uh, on rise recently. Can we say that new variants are more conti uh, uh, contagious and dangerous and uh, uh, new vaccination programs will be needed for new variants. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Van Kerkhoff is ready to answer that question. Thanks very much for the question. So, um, you know, as DG pointed out, we have seen some worrying trends for COVID in recent months. Um, and in the countries that are continuing to report to us, we do see increases in case detection in some countries. More worrying is that we're seeing some increases in hospitalizations and in admissions to ICU. The data that we have globally to assess the circulation of this virus, the monitoring, uh, the known variants that are in circulation, the ability to detect new ones is reducing um, because surveillance is declining. This is one of the points the DG made in his speech today, sustaining the gains that have been made um, for COVID-19 across collaborative surveillance, across 
all of the different elements of response are needed for now, but also for those future threats that we face that, that Mike just mentioned. Um, but I think what we can say is that the variants that are in circulation, we're still dealing with Omicron and many of the sublineages. We have three variants of interest that we're tracking, um, XBB.1.5, XBB.1.16, and EG.5. EG.5 is on the rise um, around the world, and the other two XBBs are, are starting to decline. But we don't have any one variant that is dominant worldwide. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, all of these viruses that are in circulation can cause the full range of disease. We have not detected a change in severity. Um, if you are infected with this virus, whatever variant is circulating, it can cause either asymptomatic infection all the way to severe disease and death. The good news is that our countermeasures work. We have many countermeasures that can prevent infection, and this ranges from improving ventilation, where we live, where we work, where we study, wearing of masks, respirators, personal protective equipment, distancing, um, the use of vaccinations, COVID-19 vaccines remain safe and effective and prevent severe disease and death, advanced um, Therapeutics can prevent the development of disease and it can prevent, if you are diseased, from going on to develop severe disease. There's so much that we can do now. So we have not detected a change in severity. What we are working on with our member states, with everyone around the world, is to have good surveillance so that we could track these viruses that we can track the variants, we can conduct risk assessments as quickly as possible. One of the elements of this is um, not only testing and reporting of cases, hospitalizations, ICU, but reporting of the sequences themselves. So we've had a decline in the number of sequences that are available from around the world, but we've also had a decline from where those sequences are coming from. We need good representation of sequences from around the world. And again, the good news is that the capacities for PCR-based testing, the capacities for genomic sequencing around the world has expanded dramatically. We love to give the example of Somalia. I'm looking at Mike, we were just talking about this before. Um, a country that didn't have PCR-based capacity or sequencing capacity before the pandemic and now has across the country. We can give examples across many countries around the world that now can do the sequencing. So these are gains that need to be sustained, not just for the current threats, but for all future th threats that we face. Um, so yes, COVID is still circulating. It's still circulating in countries. And there's a lot that we can do to prevent infections, prevent severe disease, and prevent death. Thank you, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Dr. Brion, would you like to add on the vaccine composition work that's been going on? Yeah, sure. And I think what, what is important to uh, understand, as Maria alluded to, is that uh, um, we have different lineage of viruses. Uh, even if no one is dominant, I think this is um, an important um, um, characteristic of, of COVID-19 uh, vi virus is that it is evolving, uh, it is changing, and so uh, we need to uh, constantly assess what those changing means on the effectiveness of the vaccine. And so this is why uh, when we see that the effectiveness of the vaccine is uh, reducing, uh, then uh, we have called a group of experts called TAC-COVAC uh, to look at the composition of the vaccine and see if we change the composition of the vaccine, meaning the antigen that we put in the vaccine, would this allow vaccinated people to have a better immunity against uh, the virus. And so uh, this group uh, has met in May and has provided recommendation. And we meet again uh, in a few weeks' time to uh, look again at the data and see if we can uh, uh, have um, uh, uh, the better vaccine uh, by changing uh, the, the composition. So uh, the current vaccine that are available uh, are, are really good vaccines, so they protect uh, people. And so um, uh, depending also on the epidemiology in each country, its context, uh, that's why uh, countries are recommending a new vaccination uh, so that the people who are at higher risk to uh, have severe disease, hospitalization, or death could be uh, protected better uh, should the virus uh, uh, be circulating heavily in this uh, population. So it's a context-based decision, of course, and, uh, and, uh, but we are working to monitor really the evolution of the virus and its dynamic so that we can provide uh, the best uh, recommendation possible regarding the composition of the vaccine. Thank you. Can I, can I just add, because I think it's a yeah. 
important just to for the public to understand that the WHO has been doing this kind of activity for over half a century in terms of constantly surveying that viral world for influenza, looking at the evolution of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of viruses within those families uh, uh, over the the uh, over the last 50 plus years, with 70 years, within guess 70 years. Uh, and this is one of the real, uh, I suppose, contributions, one of those global goods that WHO brings to the world with the support of our member states and the WHO collaborating centers and the hundreds of laboratories contribute to that system. This is about collective security. We protect ourselves by collecting data, by bringing samples to reference labs, by sequencing, by characterizing these viruses, by tracking the severity of disease in hospitals, by tracking the impact and the epidemiology of these respiratory viruses in communities. Putting all that information together, we're able to decide twice a year for the North and Southern Hemisphere what should be in the influenza vaccine every year. The COVID work is an extension of that. It brings a different group of experts with expertise in COVID, and, but many similar and many experts from that same community. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real example of the added value that the World Health Organization brings to this a service that we can deliver, a platform we can deliver for our member states uh, that allows member states to communicate, to work together to come up with the right solutions so we can protect our communities from influenza and now from, uh, from COVID-19. Thank you very much for all those answers. And now we'll move on to Helen Branswell from STAT. Helen, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, my question is about uh, Ebola and um, DRC. I've read that uh, DRC is is vaccinating in Butembo, I think as a precaution, I guess, to to prevent a resurgence there. Does WHO know about this program? Can you tell us anything about sort of the scope of the, the program and which vaccine is being deployed? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I'll hand that over to Dr. Brian. I, I don't have any direct information on that, but I know that the authorities in uh, DR Congo, we're looking at uh, using um, a two-dose vaccine for health workers and using that more extensively from a prevention point of view. As to my knowledge, there is no active outbreak in, um, in Congo um, and uh, there is no outbreak response underway as such. Um, so I we will check and get back to you. Um, and and the, really, the, there's only two vaccines that could possibly be used. There's a there's a there's a, a, a Merck vaccine and there's a J and J vaccine. One is a single dose. One is a double dose. There have been doses of the uh, uh, the single dose uh, vaccine have been pre-stockpiled in Congo. Um, and we'd have to check whether or not they're being used as part of a study to look at longer term protection or whether it's the J&J &J vaccine uh, being deployed for the purposes of protecting health workers. I just haven't got that uh, micro knowledge to hand right now. So we'll get back to you, Helen, directly after this uh, presser. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Uh, the next question goes to Gabriela Sotomayor from Processa, uh, Processo. Sorry, Gabriela, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola, uh, to everybody. Uh, one clarification and one question, if may I. Uh, the clarification is, where can we check the list of countries that are giving you the data on COVID-19 deaths, hospitalizations, etc.? Because it looks like that not all the member states are collaborating with WHO, so I just want to know where is the list or where can we access that. Now, my question. Um, According to a report in Mexico published by Coneval, a highly respected institution, from 2018 to 2022, 50 million Mexicans do not have access to health services. This is 30 million more people since the last report in 2018. Furthermore, uh, the number of children without measles vaccine increases and the shortage of medicines increases as well. So uh, we are talking about Mexico that is a country of the G20. So the government is not investing in the health system. So I, I would like to, to hear uh, Dr. Tedros comments uh, on this very worrying situation because even High Commissioner Volker Turk 
uh, he, boy, High Commissioner for Human Rights, referred to this problem at the opening of the Human Rights Council uh, here in Geneva. So uh, if you have comments on this, thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriella. It's, as you know, we don't normally make country-specific responses, but I think Dr. Tedros has something to say. Uh, sorry, I, I don't have the figures that you have. Maybe the best we can do is, uh, you know, we can come back to you after checking what you have just uh, said, because as you know, it will be very difficult to know the figures by country and respond. Um, and I would be happy to get back to you, though. So thanks, Gabriella. So if you could send the questions and all those numbers that you've mentioned to media inquiries, we'll sort it out for you. Uh, the next question goes to, and that's the first part. Okay, yes, please go ahead, sorry. Uh, sorry, just the first part of the question I can clarify. So the question was around the, where, who's, which countries are providing uh, data to WHO on COVID. Us mentioning how many countries are, are providing this information is not an attempt to name and shame. It's really an attempt to plea with governments who are continuing to collect this information to continue to report it to us. You can look on our dashboard and you can see which countries are providing information on cases and deaths. This is a dashboard that we are updating regularly based on the information we receive from the member states through our regional offices. But many countries are integrating COVID-19 into um, with, with influenza, for example, in the GISRIS dashboard. Um, and so that's a good thing that we see data coming in from sentinel-based sites and non-sentinel-based sites from hospitals, for example. And that information that comes in includes information on the numbers of tests that are being performed, performed for influenza and for SARS-CoV-2, the percent positivity. Um, there's data that countries report through um, reports on their websites, and this is very helpful for us. What is really challenging right now is in this transition phase where we're out of a crisis, but we're actually dealing with COVID, we're managing COVID as part of respiratory disease management, as part of infectious disease management, um, it's a bit of a messy period. And what our teams are trying to do in countries and regions and here in HQ is to troll the web and to find this information where it exists. And we need member states' help. We need help particularly with impact data, looking at hospitalizations, ICU death, looking at uptake of vaccines, and importantly, when, how, much, how much of the population that are in the at-risk groups have received an additional dose within the last year, for example. Um, and that's where we need help. So our dashboard um, is currently being updated as much as we can. We're looking at revising our dashboard, um, how we can integrate different information, looking at impact, looking at wastewater surveillance, um, looking at data on variants so that it's, you can look all in one place. So I, we don't say this to, to really name and shame. It's really just a plea to help us do a better evaluation of what is in circulation, what threat it continues to pose. And I wanted to make one clarification comment as well on the vaccine question, to be very clear that the COVID-19 vaccines that are currently in use are protective against the variants that are in circulation, including the variants of interest that are in circulation and the variant under monitoring, this one where we have less than 200 sequences worldwide, the variant under monetary BA.2.86. So SAGE is meeting this week to look at updated policy recommendations, but let's be very clear. If it is your time to receive an additional dose, especially if you are in an at-risk group, don't wait. Get a vaccine because vaccines protect against severe disease and death. Thank you very much, and thank you for that clarification, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, now, the next question goes to Nina Larson uh, of Agence France Press. Nina, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you for taking my question. I was hoping you could say a little bit more about the health concerns around um, the exodus uh, from Nagorno-Karabakh um, and uh, what specific, what your main health concerns are. I understand it's nearly half the population that has fled by now, so I assume um, the housing issue and also coming cold is, is a problem. And if you have any insight into the level of injuries uh, from the fuel depot blast uh, earlier this week, that would be also helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. Uh, I think for, for the numbers and so on, we don't have that, but I think Dr. Michael Ryan already did cover this, but I'll let him say some more. The, yeah, what, what concerned about the health concerns. It's just a 
dealing with something else there. Yes, um, it's. Uh, uh, you've all seen the images. You've all seen the people fleeing across the border. You've seen the older persons and the young children. And uh, it reminds me of so many other times in uh, our careers, just watching people fleeing from violence and fleeing in fear. Um, um, it has significant public health implications for people who, uh, who who move in the conditions they're moving. First of all, people are moving very slowly. They're stuck on roads. There, are, it's cold. Children are getting uh, children are getting cold. They're being, they're, there's a lot of risk of exposure. A lot of people, possibly up to one third of the 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 Nagorno Karabakh's uh, ethnic Armenian population has moved in a very very short time. Um, and the health needs in that situation are always immense because people come with nothing. They don't have their their normal meds with them. They're not. Uh, they haven't eaten. They're thirsty. There's a risk of dehydration. There's a risk of exposure to to disease. Um, and there are the psychological um, uh, traumas that go along with that. Uh, I think right now, given the uh, given the cold temperatures at night, emergency shelter is absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, people that are arriving are exhausted. They need urgent assistance, as I say, as well as that psychological support. There's a need that people get back on their medications if they don't have them with them, and that again is a is a is 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 not as easy. It's easy said. It's not as easy done. But people with diabetes, hypertension, HIV, TB, we forget these things in these situations. When people move, they don't always move uh, with the things they need to support them when they get there. Um, we have offices in both countries and we're very much supporting the uh, ICRC and their efforts and all the other partners on the ground. And uh, <clears throat> we don't have independent verification of what's happening on the Gora Karabakh side, but what we are doing right now is focusing on supporting the Armenian authorities in supporting those people who are fleeing uh, across the border. Um, the explosion uh, is another disaster within a disaster and that means we have lots of people with burns in particular blast injuries and burns uh, they are being treated uh, inside the 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 area uh, i've seen the images myself there are many people with what look like really severe burns that are going to require very extensive medical and surgical interventions and again we're we stand ready to support with with uh, emergency medical team support i know there are uh, other emergency medical teams there and i know this is something that the icrc will manage and will coordinate and we're we stand ready to to support them in that so once again in the world we have innocent people fleeing conflict um leaving everything behind them uh, and all of the risks that that brings to their life their health and their psychological well-being Dr. Uh, Tedros, please. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Mike had already said it, uh, but one thing I'd like to underline is those who are fleeing are actually the vulnerable ones. Mm. And um, I think um, all uh, parties should really protect the uh, civilians who are, who are fleeing because they're very vulnerable as well. Uh, but at the same time, international law should, should, should be respected. And from WHO's side, we will do everything to support. Um, and the number is increasing. Uh, I think the estimate now is even more than 40,000. Uh, we will mobilize in order uh, to support, but the increasing number will be, we know, we understand, going to be difficult to catch, to, to catch up. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Tedros. Uh, we've gone past the hour, so we've only got time for one more question, and that will go to Donato Mantini from the Financial Times. So, Donato, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, um, I think you may have seen the Nature Study on Molnupiravir that appeared a couple of days ago showing that it increases mutations in the coronavirus and that these can be passed on between patients, even though no variant of concern is currently linked to the signature associated with molnupiravir. So what what do you say about these findings in general? Are you considering changing your guidelines for use of this drug? Obviously, I know there's a big uh, access deal in place. Um, is molnupiravir even necessary anymore? Um, any... Any comment will be helpful. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Donato. Uh, we may need to get the clinical team to uh, to provide you with advice and information, but Dr. Van Kerkhoff is going to start answering the question. Yeah, thanks, Donato, for the question. So we welcome all new evidence that are coming out on treatments. This is something that needs to continue as we learn more about the use of treatments um, in the fourth year of this pandemic. Um, you mentioned its link to variants. One of the things I want to highlight, and we will get the clinical team to come back on the specifics of the monopiravir, but one of the things that um, there may be a misunderstanding of where variants emerge from, and that it's the, there's only one or two possible ways in which we can see the emergence of new variants. Um, variants can emerge from anywhere. Uh, this virus is circulating. Uh, in every country. Um, we've already talked about the limited visibility that we have on tracking the known variants and the ability to detect, detect new ones. Um, we have very limited sur surveillance in animal populations, um, looking at spillback, spill forward, and the potential mutations. We saw that cluster five variant in September 2020. Um, but we do need to uh, evaluate the use of therapeutics and any, and they're, they're the benefits, the wonderful benefits that we actually see in preventing severe disease. Um, so we are aware of the studies that have come out, but I did just want to highlight that um, variants can emerge anywhere. It's not one particular population. Um, it's not one particular country or one particular region, which is why we need good surveillance in all countries um, associated with its circulation, associated with the use of therapeutics, associated with uh, people working at the animal-human interface and immunocompromised individuals, et cetera, so that we could do these robust and rapid risk assessments to evaluate what's actually happening out there and determine whether or not we need to update our therapeutic guidance. I will say that our therapeutic guidance um, is a living guidance and it's updated regularly. It's in its 14th version. We continue to rely on experts in our guideline development groups who assess all available information and make updates as necessary. And we do have a range of therapeutics that are out there. We don't only rely on one particular uh, medicine, and that's a good thing um, so that we have options for people around the world. We do need to continue to work on access, affordability of these treatments so that people who require this clinical care, regardless of the therapeutic, get it in a timely manner. And that is a problem still around the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. And on that note... Um, Margaret, can I just... Ah, Dr. Dr. Ryan's got something to add. some information to, to Helen on the... Um, <clears throat> on Ebola vaccine. Uh, yes, Helen, there is a, a campaign underway for vaccinating frontline workers. Uh, it's in North Kivu and Ituri, uh, and it's aimed at utilizing uh, vaccines that would otherwise go beyond their shelf life. So these vaccines are stockpiled for the purpose of outbreak response, and as is a standard practice in many of the stockpiles we use, we, we can then use those vaccines. We don't want to waste those vaccines. We want to use them for public health purposes. So we would use them in, in protecting frontline workers in the very area where the that virus emerged. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, our target population is approximately 7,000 frontline workers, of which about 70% have been have been vaccinated. So uh, that's the that's the my current information on uh, related to your question. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Ryan. So there you are. You've got a really fresh information. Uh, now we're going to close, but first of all, I'll ask Dr. Professor Parham if he's got some final remarks because it's a privilege to have you with us, sir. Final remarks. I have so many remarks. <laughs> Um, I would just like to say that, you know, I'm, I am a gynecologic oncologist, a cancer surgeon, and I have been living and working full time in <clears throat> Lusaka, Zambia for the past 20 years. Um, that was a passion I had, and I just decided to give up my work in the United States and move to Africa. And now, because of support from the DG, I've been able to move around sub-Saharan Africa, I know that people are not using that term anymore, um, to various countries. And I have been singularly impressed with the commitment of frontline workers, doctors, nurses who have very little to work with, but who are inspired to do their best to try to eliminate cervical cancer with vinegar, putting vinegar on the cervix, 
and trying to visualize abnormal lesions, we now have this more sophisticated uh, test called the HPV test. But they have just taken the things that they have, um, surgical equipment that's not nearly what you would expect to be in an operating room, um, but trying to do their very, very best and to advocate and to educate. And so this, this elimination initiative, when the DG made the call, it's just amazing how it switched everybody on, how it has energized workers um, in, in, in these countries where there's just ver there are very few resources and they really want to do it. They really are trying. <laughs> and I think the, your expert group was, was spot on when they talked about the necessity of now focusing resources on the front line, putting resources on the front line to, to give a boost to this, this innate effort, uh, organic effort, that is already going on in, inside the countries. And I'm, I'm convinced that this disease can be eliminated. I, I never thought it could, but just what I've seen over the past four or five years, um, I'm, I'm convinced that it can be if, if, if we focus on the frontline workers in the countries and help them get the things that they need in order to implement HPV vaccination uh, cervical cancer screening and treatment. I think I think your pillars are just. I mean, you you were you you were right on target, right on target. So um, that's I could go on and on and on, but you don't you don't you don't you don't want me to preach the gospel about cervical cancer. But um, I want to thank the DG for making the move that he did to make the call to eliminate this disease. And if again, if we help people to get what they need, I, I'm pretty sure we can eliminate this disease. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And to that is uh, sure we can. Um, I think um, said it many times, cervical cancer is a major killer, a leading cause of death in, in women, especially in Africa. Uh, and it's sad that it's a major killer, despite the effective tools that we have at hand. When you don't have the tools and women are dying or people are dying, then, of course, um, still it's, it's tragic. But it's not more tragic when you have the tools and you cannot save them and they're still dying. And we have the tools, we have the vaccines, and we have the treatments, um, the tests. I think the only thing left is the action. And as I said earlier, uh, we're now even moving from two doses to one dose because that's enough. Uh, we can cover uh, more uh, people, actually more women and, and girls and save more women and, 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 and girls. Uh, and I call on all who can contribute to really take cervical cancer seriously and uh, join the elimination uh, effort. Again, thank you, uh, Professor, for your leadership uh, and um, uh, to our uh, members of the press. Uh, thank you for, for joining us and uh, I hope uh, although there was no question on cervical cancer today, uh, you will uh, highlight that and uh, you will continue to add your voice to, uh, to save uh, women. Uh, so thank you for joining us and see you next time.